Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. Uh, as you guys know, I am Christina, or you can call me Radix, whatever you feel comfortable with. <laughs> but um, I wanted to do a little update on the uh, CIA Vault 7 leak trial. Um, Mr. Joshua Schulte has been convicted. Uh, he's been found guilty under the Espionage Act of all nine counts. He still faces a separate charge for alleged CP. I cannot <laughs> say the, what that is because of um, the community guidelines here on YouTube. But um, uh, that, that charge, just so everybody knows, is questionable. And I'll tell you why. He was running a public server that other people had access to and he did not know everything that was on the server, but also the CIA has, as Chuck Schumer said, six ways from Sunday of getting back at you, right? If they think you've done something to screw them over, we know that they're able to plant things on people's devices. In fact, they did this to Cheryl Atkinson's husband, and she had a forensic examiner verify that. So that's something to keep in mind uh, when it comes to Mr. Schulte. But I just wanted to make an interesting connection here for you guys, an in interesting commentary. I don't know, you know, what to make of this, and it may or may not be coincidental. But one of the things that I saw when I was reading about Vault 7 on the WikiLeaks website was they were talking about sort of like an internal war between the NSA and the CIA and... Um, basically that the CIA had created their own internal version of the NSA, the CCS. And what's weird about it, it's like, I guess they didn't want to have to go to the NSA for um, permission for some of their hacking activities, you know? And I think that it, it, there's a, a level here of like accountability that like they didn't want, right? They didn't want to have to tell the NSA, like they come to the NSA and they say, look, we, we need permission to do this or that. Like we need this uh, operational capability. And then the NSA says, well, what, what are we doing getting involved in like the French elections? Because that's what we learned from Vault 7, by the way. We learned that the CIA meddled in the uh, 2012 French elections. We learned that a so-called diplomatic uh, office um, in Germany was actually a covert CIA hacking base and they were hacking our own allies. We learned that the CIA is able to turn every Samsung smart TV into a covert microphone, possibly camera as well. So we, we've we learned a lot about what the CIA was doing and perhaps should not be doing and was in violation of their own mandate, right? They're not supposed to be spying on American citizens. Well, what are they really doing? Uh, there is no accountability. There's no transparency. There's no real oversight of the CIA. I think the last time they were really like kind of even remotely held accountable for their actions was during the church committee. And we learned that they had things like a heart attack gun. We learned that they engaged in human experimentation um, under MKUltra and its associated sub projects. And by the way, we don't know everything that they did because Richard Helms shredded the documents. The only reason we know about MKUltra is because of financial documents that were saved that just briefly mentioned what the projects were that they needed funding for. So think about what that means. We only know really a fraction of what they were doing and I'm sure it has only gotten worse since then because they were never held accountable for any of that. Oh, and another thing that we learned is that the CIA can remotely hack vehicles. I will just mention the convenient and disturbing and fiery death of investigative journalist Michael Hastings in 2013, who before he, was di before he died was working on an expose on none other than John Brennan. The director of the CIA at the time. He had been concerned about John Brennan's witch hunt of investigative journalists. Michael Hastings had also apparently reached out to Jennifer Robinson of WikiLeaks 
the 24 hours in the 24 hours preceding his death. He also believed that the FBI was investigating him and had sent out an email to colleagues saying he was going off the grid and he was concerned. He was working on some files that were associated with WikiLeaks as well, uh, and these come from the uh, H.B. Gary, what was learned from um, Stratford and H.B. Gary and stuff like that, prior leaks. And so when that stuff happened, the Obama administration kind of went crazy about these leaks, and they created an, what they called the Internal Threat program or the insider threat program to try to find and identify would-be whistleblowers before they have the ability to blow the whistle inside any of these agencies. And we really haven't had any whistleblowers, have we? We haven't had anyone provide any substantial whistleblowing or documentation in any of these federal agencies in a very long time. And I think that that insider threat program is why. So just a, an interesting aside here. Uh, Edward Snowden began at the CIA. He started at the CIA. He was friends with people like Michael Hayden. And then he goes to work for Booz Allen Hamilton as an NSA contractor. And he does the biggest leak in the history of the NSA. And it causes this kind of international firestorm around unconstitutional, uh, warrantless uh, mass surveillance of American citizens. And he's in Hong Kong. He somehow gets to Russia without getting apprehended. He gets favorable media coverage. And I want you to consider what you know about Mockingbird, the CIA project of infiltrating newsrooms, okay? So if the CIA is controlling the media, and Edward Snowden worked for the CIA, and when he leaks on the NSA, he's given tons of media coverage, favorable coverage. He's got Laura Pointress, a documentarian filmmaker, running around with him. He's got Glenn Greenwald and The Guardian. He's got all these people working with him. He has Julian Assange trying to help him. So you have to ask yourself some questions about Edward Snowden and what he was really doing uh, with the NSA in light of what we learned from Vault 7 of this internal war between the CIA and the NSA. And here's another interesting tidbit. Joshua Schulte started out at the NSA and then he goes to work for the CIA and he does the biggest leak in the history of the CIA. So it's like, wow. The snowden Shalty mirror is very strange. Snowden, CIA to NSA, biggest leak in the history of the NSA, tries to damage and get the NSA shut down. Shalty goes from NSA to CIA, biggest leak in the history of the CIA, and they have to shut down their um, hacking stuff immediately, their hacking operations. Uh, so it's just, it, it's kind of weird in that sense. And another thing that is strange about that is Mr. Schulte chose to represent himself this time around. He was first tried in 2020 and there was a mistrial declared due to reasonable doubt, right? Like when a juror was leaving, they asked her what she thought and she said, I don't, I don't think he's guilty, you know, let the brother go or whatever. Um... And there, I think he did, from what I have saw of this, I think there was major reasonable doubt, and we'll get into that in a second. But it's just very interesting that he chose to represent himself, and at this trial, he mentions the shadow brokers. So if you don't know what shadow brokers are, I suggest you look it up. Look into it. So um, going back, though, to the beginning here um, with Mr. Schulte in, in Vault 7, the Vault 7 leaks happen. It's this big firestorm inside the CIA. Uh, Mike Pompeo goes nuts. He proposes kidnapping and assassinating Julian Assange, um, by the way, using a contracting company called UC Global and Sheldon Adelson. What is Sheldon Adelson doing uh, working for the CIA? That's a question when we know he's also, in his own words, uh, before he passed away loyal to a foreign country, and all he cared about was being a good Zionist. So that's interesting. Um, but 
uh, during the 2020 trial, you know, a lot of things, a lot of information is brought up that suggests, like, they don't actually know who leaked this stuff to WikiLeaks or when it even happened. They have no idea when this stuff was leaked. They know that when it was published, which was in March of 2017, they have no idea when it was given to WikiLeaks or by whom. There's no actual digital footprint that says this person did it on this date and this is how. And what we learned, the reason that uh, the WikiLeaks um, called the leak Vault 7 was because the CIA's um, super secure, <laughs> you know, computers that house their cyber arsenal, they were kept in these... Um, these uh, secure rooms, right? That is sort of like a skiff. Like you have, it's shaped like a, a bank vault. The door literally looks like a, a bank vault. You have to have a key code and ID to access it, a pin code and a photo ID to access it or whatever. So inside the vault, right? There's these, um, the CIA computers that house their entire cyber arsenal. There's one system called the DevLAN system. You want to know what the password was for the DevLAN system? My sweet summer. All lowercase, no spaces. My sweet summer. That's the level of like OPSEC here at the CIA. <laughs> My sweet summer. I... <laughs> I have more secure passwords than that. That to me is just amazing. And then they have another system called Confluence. Do you want to know the password to Confluence? Their other, you know, super secure computer with their entire cyber arsenal that you'd think that they would want to protect. The password on that was ABC123DEV, like DEV standing for developer. So ABC one two three Dev and My Sweet Summer, that was the level of OPSEC at the CIA for their entire hacking arsenal, and there were over two hundred people that had access to Devlan and Confluence. And so what Mr. Shalti argued at trial was that you've got potentially two hundred other suspects that could have done this. Moreover, it was so insecure as a system that you have foreign actors who could have done this, that could have leaked this stuff to WikiLeaks. He had left um, the CIA a year before this happened. So a year before WikiLeaks published Vault 7. And one of the reasons he left was because he had a problem with a coworker, a mall, who one could call a diversity hire. According to Shalti, a mall was a drug dealer and had threatened people and was just very difficult to work with or get along with and threatened other people and was just like generally unpleasant. So Schulte does a workplace complaint and like any kind of corporate office, think about like corporate HR and like a Fortune 500 company. That's like what you have at the CIA. You've got this like the HR people, you know, they're sort of like corporate HR and they're like, oh, well, you know, file a, a complaint and we'll escalate it or whatever. They have like a system for this. Basically, he does that. And the one of the guys is the manager. He's like a new manager. He has no experience managing people at that point. That was something Mr. Schulte got him to admit uh, under oath during the retrial, which was just fascinating. Like the CIA puts this guy in charge of people. He's got zero experience. So, um... Anyways, they get mad at Schulte for filing this like workplace complaint against this guy. And they say, you know, too bad, like basically just deal with it, right? Like we're not going to escalate this any further. So Schulte goes basically behind the back of the CIA. He takes out a restraining order on this guy. So the CIA has to move him to a different like workplace and they are pissed. The CIA is not used to personnel like not accepting what they say or whatever like they even admitted this under oath they were like shocked that somebody that worked for them didn't just do what they said like that's what why they didn't like this guy and he was the only person that was a suspect the only person they even investigated so it kind of seems like perhaps there was some kind of vendetta there um, that they just didn't like the guy. They thought he was basically autistic and difficult. And they, they certainly didn't like that he was a, like a, 
a free thinker, right? At the agency, like once you're CIA, you're always CIA and you are not to question them. You don't cause waves, like you do what you're told and you like it. They like people who are agency men, who everything is for the agency and that you don't question them. You don't question your superiors. You certainly don't think for yourself. You, you don't act for yourself. You do nothing that could damage the agency. But Mr. Schalte took this workplace complaint basically into his own hands and he did something about it that they didn't like. So I thought that was very interesting uh, that that came out at trial and a number of other things. So. Basically, um, what happened the first time, when he was first arrested, he was put into the MCC, the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Manhattan, New York, all right, New York City. Um, he was being held under torturous conditions, so they were bolting him to the floor naked. Um, they would keep him in this special, like, isolation, right, kind of in the same way that Julian Assange was, where he wasn't allowed to go outside, wasn't allowed to have dental care or doctor care. Um, and if he wanted to interact with his lawyer, um, they would have to have a CIA person there as well, like a CIA intermediary. If he wanted to work on discovery and production with his own lawyer in his own defense, that she had to give that to a CIA person who would review it for what they call NDI, National Defense Information and then they would give it to Shalti and they'd drag their feet. They would take a month, two months maybe. So he could not prepare his own defense. He couldn't talk to his lawyer. His lawyer um, was threatened by the CIA multiple times. What they told her was like, basically, if in any way we think that you've you violate national security, like we're gonna come after you. So that creates a conflict with her, by the way, and this is why he ends up representing himself during the retrial, because his lawyers now have to balance their own self-interest with the interest of their client. That's They're not supposed to have to do that. The CIA is in charge of all of the documents that can be seen, all of the evidence. Anyone that he wants to have testify, the CIA, like the CIA basically is running everything and the judge, accepted this both times, you know, that the CIA was running the first thing as a show trial, a kangaroo court, and still he was, you know, they had a mistrial the first time. There was enough reasonable doubt. And the second time he just says, screw it. Like, I can't do this. I can't mount a proper defense. I can't communicate with my attorneys. I can't even do any kind of production or discovery that doesn't go through the CIA and then they waste time, they drag their feet, They some of my exhibits they don't want in because they claim that it's national defense information even if it isn't classified information, another interesting distinction. So he decides he's gonna represent himself and that's what he did. It's literally one man going up against the entire CIA, the FBI, the DOJ. That in and of itself was amazing and stunning. And the judge even admitted that he did a good job, that he started learning how to like cross-examine people. The judge said towards the end, you might have a future career as a defense lawyer, you know, like if he's found not guilty. But uh, this was New York, you know, it's a Manhattan jury. And unfortunately, a lot of people tend to believe these federal agencies, even though they don't deserve it, they kind of give them a credibility that they should not have. So I was disappointed from what I saw of this trial. There was absolutely tons of reasonable doubt, and that's all it takes to find somebody not guilty, and yet they didn't do it. And I tend to think it was because Mr. Schulte represented himself, and I think that they didn't they didn't like his demeanor because he's a very autistic man, um, very smart guy, but that can come off sometimes as smug. So it's just all around uh, a travesty of justice. And it's very sad. And uh, it, I, you know, I feel like that the CIA is never going to be held accountable. They're going to continue to run wild. You know, they're going to continue to torture people, do their extrajudicial um, things that they do, torture, kidnapping, oh, renditioning, excuse me, extraordinary rendition, enhanced interrogation, and so on and so forth. So that's my update for the 
Schulte case. Very sad to see. You hate to see it. But then again, it's not surprising. In a kangaroo court in show trial, what did we expect?